asking the right questions. Is CO2 driving temperature or is temperature driving CO2? The latter must be true because the solubility of gases in water is dependent on temperature. But then what is driving temperature? Dust. Soot, silt, spores, dust forms the cores to water droplets that form clouds at low altitudes. At high altitudes, they form the cores to ice crystals that form ice clouds. These ice clouds play a crucial role in the climatic cycle. If you want to know if a system is dysfunctional, you need to know how it functions under normal circumstances. Now here you see the sawtooth pattern of rapid warming and slow cooling four times in a row in the past half million years. Now notice that temperature and CO2 are doing the same thing. They go up and down in the same way. But dust does the reverse. So what is happening? In the beginning of the cycle, when there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, the CO2 and the water together form large organic molecules and oxygen through photosynthesis. These large organic molecules are stored in the plants and in the soils. But the atmosphere becomes dry and inflammable. In the end of such a cycle, we get frequent fire. And the frequent fire returns these large organic molecules to the atmosphere as CO2, water, and fire dust. And they climb because of the heat at high altitudes, and there they form ice clouds. In the beginning of your cycle, evaporation dominates over fire, and we have enormous condensation clouds that reflect solar radiation. At the end of the cycle, we have fire that dominates over evaporation. So we still have clouds that reflect solar heat, but they're the ice clouds. But this phase ends when these ice clouds get so polluted with fire dust that they cannot reflect the heat anymore, and we move from cooling to warming. This is a short phase. The troposphere expands, the ice clouds melt, the fire dust rains out, and we get evaporation again that forms condensation clouds that reflect solar heat again, and we go from warming to cooling. Now, there's a problem with this model, because during this long cooling phase, we have had enormous uh, sinks of organic carbon that are being formed. And at each glacial cycle, the CO2 concentration gets back to 300 parts per million. And um, so where is that carbon coming from? Ocean ridges spread constantly, and they feed the oceans with greenhouse gas, like CO2 and methane. But how can dust transfer that CO2 and methane from the oceans to the atmosphere? In 2020, we had these tremendous fires in Australia, and this research shows that within a week, the fire dust was at uh, 15 kilometers where they formed these ice clouds. Currents carry such clouds to the poles over ever smaller latitudes and concentrate these cl clouds in polar direction. When these clouds are extremely polluted, they do not reflect the heat anymore, and they let it through in the troposphere, especially in the polar areas. The Arctic has a heat excess. This heat excess is driving the pressure systems in the Pacific. Right now, we are dealing with a very powerful Alachian low. And it attracts this enormous cloud of CO2 production that we detected by remote sensing. And it is led along the American coast to the Red Star, where we have a very revealing study. The study shows that with the red areas indicate stronger winds, and with stronger winds, the water coming to the surface comes from deeper. And we also see, if we lay our Mauna Loa diagram over it, that in that same period, we get most CO2 emission. This happens each year. We have been seeing this for the past 60 years. Eight months of CO2 emission, 
four months of CO2 uptake, seven part per million emission, five part per million of uptake. For the past six years, 120 part per million, which is the amount of CO2 that we thought had been produced by industry. But as I just showed to you, it is coming from the oceans. Where are we in that cycle right now? Right now, we are beyond the interglacial maximum. We have had a period of cooling, the little ice age, and our CO2 emission is far beyond the ceiling of 300 part per million that we know of normally. So, what's going on? It can't be the Milankovic cycles, because when you have highest eccentricity, you don't have highest temperature or highest emission. It influences it, but it doesn't drive it. If we look at sunspots, we see that they have a periodicity of 11 years, we see that they go slightly down in intensity, and we see that our CO2 emission is increasing, so something else is going on. Here, I plotted our flying hours, decaton flying hours each year, against the yearly CO2 emission of the oceans. And the line gives the average relation between the two, and we see it's increasing. And we asked the program, what is the probability that the two are not related? And the program said it's 10 to the minus 6, which is neglectable. So our flying influences our ocean CO2 emission. But there is a strong bias. As you can see over here, in 2013, we have the Chelyabinsk hitting Siberia. And it produced a lot of dust in the lowermost stratosphere. So dust gives heating, gives higher CO2 emission. And here, we have the El Chichon, which exploded in 1984. And volcanoes produce 90% water. So water gives cooling. And here, we have the 1998 El Nino event. El Nino events relate to the pressure systems in the Americas. So we have had a weaker wind going from land to sea. We have had a weaker uh, upwelling and as a result, rotting. And the heat anomaly comes from the Arctic. Now let's look at uh, our pandemics. What we see here, the SARS pandemics, we fly less, we get less CO2 emission from the oceans. And when we look at COVID, I don't have all the data from the flying hours from that period, but we see that they are relatively low. We see that 2020 is low relative to um, the emission of 2019. We would expect it to increase, but it doesn't. And when we uh, stay at home in 21 and 22, we see that it is uh, very low. It is like the emission of 2013 or 14. And in 22, we return to flying, but there seems to be a lag, a lag of about um, half a year, slightly more three quarter of a year. How can we go back to cooling? Well, obviously we can move away from high and frequent flying and we can fly lower. We can move away from intensive farming and overgrazing by going back to hedgerows and fallow and make sure that the biodiversity is protecting our soils, retaining the dust. We can make sure that all those industrial exhausts have good high-tech filters. And we can also concentrate on our forests and make sure that our fire corridors are broader and our survey systems are high-tech. What is also very important is to make sure that our ocean thresholds for CO2 emission remain high. And we can do that by making sure that we gain control over particulate shedding into our aquatic systems by sea transport and by tourist industry and intensive farming. Fire dust has been driving temperature in the past, in the present. It is industrial dust that drives temperature. Thank you. <laughs>